Order, the House is resumed and I call David Shearer. Te whare a tenei, te whare paramata o Aotearoa, e tu, e tu. Ki na maima o tena whare, tena koutou katoa. Tena, ki na manahiri ki te whare, tena koutou katoa. E te iwi whanui o Aotearoa, tena koutou, tena koutou, tena tatou katoa. So na koe, Mr Speaker. I want to begin by saying thank you to the people of Mount Albert. It is my honour to represent you and serve you all as your Member of Parliament. Maiden speeches by members representing Mount Albert are rare events. In 62 years, Mount Albert has only had two MPs. And I follow in illustrious predecessors. Helen Clark will be remembered as one of New Zealand's great Prime Ministers. But on the campaign trail, I became aware of another side of her political life. 28 years serving as a devoted electorate MP, respected by Mount Albert residents across the political spectrum. And before her, Warren Freer, a cabinet minister and steadfast MP who served Mount Albert for 34 years. I want to thank the many supporters, Labour Party members, and particularly the long-standing and dedicated electorate committee workers, committee workers who have stood with me and worked so tirelessly. This result is a credit to your efforts. I see it as a portent of 2011, and to the other candidates, thank you for a clean and fair contest. The Mount Albert electorate is both young and old. 40% of its people were born outside of New Zealand, and it's been an entry point for many new New Zealanders and home for an extraordinary diversity of people, Pacific Islanders, Indians, Chinese, Somalis, Sri Lankans, and many others. One of those was a teenager who introduced himself to me as a Tampa boy. He was a refugee off the Tampa, stopped from landing in Australia, stranded in the Indian Ocean. Until the Labour government, in the face of negative opinion polls, opened the door for them to come to New Zealand. We did what was right. And now we can feel very justified. His English is fluent, he's studying at AUT, and he's so very proud to be a New Zealander. He and so many others are shaping the future face of New Zealand, attracted here by hope and opportunity, as were our ancestors. They are emblematic of our country's history. Mount Albert is also made up of long-standing residents who can trace their roots back generations, often within the same neighbourhoods. They are the soul of the strong and caring communities of Point Chevalier, Kingsland, Waterview, Awairaka, Sandringham and Mount Albert itself. Cohesive communities with strong identities are safer. They are the places where people watch over each other, their kids, their elders and their neighbours. Unfortunately today in many of those communities they feel alienated from political decision making. They are rallying against issues that many feel have been foisted upon them. The super city, a new motorway, new projects that undermine their environment. And it's clear to me that my job is to listen, to protect and to promote the communities that Mount, the people in, want in Mount Albert and elsewhere. I'm a passionate New Zealander with deep roots in Auckland and this country. But I also lived and worked in some of the countries that our migrants have come from. So I see New Zealand through a slightly different lens. What we have is all too rare in this world. It feels very right to be here. Just a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a sandbagged room in Baghdad, agonising about whether to put my name forward to stand in Mount Albert. And it was a tough decision. I was overseeing the UN's effort to reconstruct Iraq, supporting people who had suffered terribly for over 30 years. So I did what I've often done, spoke at length with my wife, my family and my close friends, people whose love and support I've depended on <coughs> all my life. And I'm proud that my wife, Anushka, and my children, Vicha and Anastasia, can be here with me today. Some argued against it. What are you thinking, they asked. You've got a family, a successful career. Why jettison all that for a life in politics? <laughs> Their view reflects the same frustration I hear in Mount Albert, that our politics is not listening or responsive to people. My decision ultimately came down to believing that I can make 
a real and positive difference, something that has motivated my life and something I've done elsewhere. Most of my life has been spent in war zones and famines in other parts of the world. And in those jobs, I've been bombed, shelled and shot at. And I've been told that's probably quite good training for Parliament. <laughs> Iraq, Gaza, Rwanda, Somalia, Sri Lanka and others working for the United Nations and Save the Children. These are the places where you confront the very worst of the world and I've sat and negotiated with people who orchestrated destu destruction and misery. But it's also where you meet the best. And I've had the great fortune and privilege to work alongside people whose daily lives are routinely heroic. Such as Hamada, who has been unable to leave Gaza for over three years because of the Israeli blockade, yet still reports reliably and objectively to the UN about the death and bombardment around him. Or Abdi, a Somali nurse, Twice a day, he fed more than 2,000 starving under fives in an area of Mogadishu that was continually under shellfire. Or my staff in Baghdad, who take two to three taxis a day to avoid being followed, knowing that if they were identified as working with the UN, their families risk kidnapping or worse. These people, and there are dozens, hundreds of others, I'm proud to say, have been part of my life, have inspired me, <clears throat> each in their own way, fighting to make a difference in their family and their community. Against injustice, against the system weighted to deny people a fair go, they are reminded to me that we can all make a difference. I see that same spirit in New Zealand. Those values of justice, fairness and opportunity are ingrained with our, within our collective DNA. It's demonstrated in the many, many people who contribute selflessly to their communities. Heading the sports clubs, the historical societies, environmental groups who help our new arrivals into our communities or advocate for the rights of workers and the dispossessed. Contributing in some way to make our community, our country, a better place. And this is a great country of wondrous landscapes, of proud achievements. We've, made significant, we've had significant moments of nation building our stand on nuclear ships, New Zealand's war of independence, it's been called. Personal to me because it was my political awakening. We took a brave decision on the Iraq war and the right one. We should exult in this independence and be proud to project our values. Be confident then to become an independent country, reject the need for another nation's flag in the corner of our own. <laughs> Be confident then, but my experience has convinced me that New Zealand can be a leader, can make a difference in the world, can influence powerful countries. Norway, with a similar population, has been at the forefront of international peace efforts. We can do the same. I've seen our armed forces and police overseas, and they are without equal. Not just for their professionalism, but more importantly, for the values and attitude they hold for their ingrained sense of fair play and justice, part of our New Zealand character. We have the can-do attitude, we need the vision. Let's be bold, let's see what's possible. Many times when I was in far-flung places, I was sustained by the thoughts of our beaches, our bush, our mountains and our lakes. Our deep love of the landscape is part of our shared cultural identity as New Zealanders, no matter where we came from. It motivated me to study environmental management, and it led me to work for the Tainui Trust Board, where I had the privilege to work for Sir Robert Mahuta, Robert Mahuta my fellow MP Nanaya's father, and his pioneering work on Māori development. That experience forced me to confront Ropatu, the confiscation of Māori land in Tonga. An injustice just as real in the hearts of those I met on the Waikato Marae as what I later encountered in conflicts throughout the world. Through the Waitangi Tribunal, we are redressing this legacy and recasting the story, but we still have a way to go. Addressing tribal rights has yet to fully translate into better education, health and prison statistics for Māori. This is perhaps our biggest challenge as a country. It is a responsibility that belongs to us all, but mostly for Māori to chart and shape their own destiny. 
Are we environmental leaders? We do okay. We've made good progress protecting our endangered species, parks and fisheries. We're famed for our landscape. We trade on our clean, green image. My worry is that our actions are falling short of our talk. Our environmental policy is hesitant and lags behind other Western nations where our main consumers live. We can be leaders. It's not only good for New Zealand business, it's good for our children and essential for the planet. We must be bold. New Zealand was built on individual initiative, hard work, strong businesses, a farming backbone and the efficiency of a free market. But we're not a collection of individuals. We're all in it together and everybody needs a fair go at opportunity. We do need to look after one another. Our country was also built on that. Individual aspirations, collective responsibility, two faces of the same coin. Personally, I've never been able to separate them to put one above the other, because each improves the lives of our citizens and unlocks our potential as a nation. Take education. A few years ago, I transported exam papers across the front lines during the Sri Lankan Civil War. I saw from the look on the faces of those who received them just how important that mission was. Because in the midst of destruction and hunger, those papers represented the future hopes of our young people for a better life. Their opportunity, their fair go. We provided the, a hand, they took the step. A chance to take control of their own lives to reach for something better. That's what all parents want for their children wherever they are. It's what I want and value for mine. We depend on our government to guarantee our educational opportunities, opportunities that are not simply as good as elsewhere in the world, but better so we can compete. And in this fast-changing world, our learning needs to be lifelong, not just school, but an ethos of learning, continual training, upskilling, and community education. We can't allow our kids and unemployed to drop out and then shut the door on their opportunities to re-engage. That's not only a tragic waste for the individuals concerned, it's a collective failing and ultimately we all lose. We also depend on our government for a public health system that's not only world class but is there when we most need it. And one that understands that preventing ill health is a whole lot better and a whole lot cheaper than curing it. We face tough times. Poverty, unemployment and uncertainty are on the rise. Now is not the time to allow our ambitions to stagnate either as a people or as a nation. Take research and development. New Zealanders are natural innovators. Our scientists and entrepreneurs are the people who will chart our future prosperity. We can't afford to be stingy with them. Now is the time to boost opportunities and to be bold. I'm a proud member of the Labour Party, a party of opportunity, a party responsible for most of the key milestones in our country's development and a party for our future. I've spoken about where I've come from and what I stand for. I'm here to listen, to make a difference, to create opportunity, to reach out to what's possible. I'm told that what you say here will come back to haunt you. I hope it does. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I declare the uh, House and Committee at 7.30 p.m. for further consideration of the Road User Charges Amendment Bill and the Appropriation 2009-10 Estimates Bill.